Top predator of the American wastelands, Deathclaws are a seminal beast in the Fallout series. Heavily derived from their chameleon ancestors, at first glance they just seem to be large and hostile carnivores, but repeated appearances have shown them to be highly adaptable animals with a surprising social system, ripe for exploration and speculation. As a quick introduction, the Deathclaws were created in a questionable attempt to make super soldiers for the war that would later create the Wasteland, using the forced evolutionary virus on Jackson's chameleons along with other sources of genetic stock. The changes are pretty clear, and include an increase in body mass of several tens of thousands of percent, bipedalism, complete reduction of the nasal horn, and significant changes to the eyes, limbs, and tail. Deathclaws are never believed to have actually been used for their intended purpose of combat, and escaped into the wild following the war, whereupon they followed their manifest destiny to colonise much of the North American wasteland, and installed themselves as the top predators across the continent. One thing that quickly stands out about Deathclaws with repeat observation is unlike their arboreal ancestors, Deathclaws are highly social animals, living in nuclear haha, families consisting of a dominant breeding pair and their offspring of assorted ages and possible siblings too. This is a behaviour known as cooperative breeding, and seems to be the subset of it known as helpers at the nest, a common point of research in behavioural ecology. But why do it? Wouldn't you get more success just by striking out on your own in the wasteland? And maybe not. Other than the oasis and despite the efforts of the lone wanderer, the wastelands can't exactly be described as the Garden of Eden. There's a lot of arid wasteland, and the former breadbasket states are still a far cry from their earlier levels of productivity. This lessened vegetation means fewer herbivores, and thus less prey for death claws. Staying with the established family unit has a lot of pros, and for one means you don't have to start the risky process of establishing your own territory that may well be contested by others. Plus, for a breeding family to already be established means the prey density in that area will be sufficient to support them, so you don't have to worry about dispersing into a bare area and risking starvation on your voyage. You also stand to inherit your parents' territory upon their death too, so it can be well worth forgoing your own early reproductive success to ensure a good home you're familiar with that'll have benefits for your own offspring later. Dialogue with Chomps Lewis does seem to suggest that if one of a breeding pair is killed, another Deathclaw will slot in to take its place. And it's worth noting that the offspring the rest of your family produce will still be closely related to you as well. Your siblings are as closely related to you as your own children would be. And so by helping your parents raise their offspring, it's still a productive move genetically overall. This is known as kin selection. So with all of that added up, it's fairly clear as to why Deathclaws would want to form the packs that they do. It's unknown how exactly the adults monopolise breeding though. It could be once males reach adulthood they leave the pack, and all the adults in the pack are females. So it's just one adult male and its mate, and then their adult daughters and sub-adult sons. And Deathclaws just habitually avoid incest as many animals try to. It was suggested for some time in social mammals that the dominant pair would emit hormones that suppressed breeding in others, but research rather shows that such suppression is behavioural over hormonal, and in other cases may be physiological, so maybe either of these options are reasonable suggestions too. It's worth noting that much of this behaviour is very aberrant for reptiles. Whilst they may live in stable aggregations and exhibit parental care, Cooperative breeding is thus far unrecorded in them. It could be possible that some of the extra zoological ingredients used to create a death claw included birds or mammals with such behaviours recorded, or the forced evolutionary virus, for one reason or another, caused them to develop this form of sociality. It could be an offshoot of traits to make them super soldiers. Cooperative breeding in mammals typically comes about in a species that have multiple young, that are monogamous, and that are social. Politicky is likely so Deathclaws could produce more Deathclaws as soon as possible, and strong kinship ties may have been a desired trait in their creation to try and make them functioning military units. So whether it came from the ingredients or the cooking, the unique social system of Deathclaws is just one of the several key factors that help them spread across the wastes. 
Careful monitoring of the social unit isn't necessary to tell the alpha individuals, however. It's abundantly clear which animals are the leaders of the pack. At up to twice the mass of the subordinates, with darker coloration and far greater horns, the breeding pair stick out like a sore thumb, and show wasteland travellers that things can indeed always get worse. The greater mass of the matriarch in particular likely allows for either larger or more young to be born, or rather laid, but in both genders it also helps them more effectively dominate and command subordinates as the leader. But what causes this? This spike in size isn't so atypical in some social animals. Whilst it's very well known in eusocial insects, it's also seen in mammals like mole rats and mongooses too. Female meerkats will grow significantly larger after attaining dominant status, and become longer bodied with wider skulls too. So it isn't just extra fat or muscle tissue, they literally grow on a skeletal level as well. The chief explanation is that upon attaining dominant status, they receive a spike in the hormones of estrogen and progesterone, some of the more important ones that encourage bone growth. It's hard to tell exactly how the body becomes aware of this social change. It could be that this is actually the natural state, but such growth is physiologically suppressed by the dominant individual. No dominant and someone else springs in to fill the void. A big spike in both bone growth and certain hormones also explains the greater horns seen in such specimens too. As both skeletal structures and secondary sexual characteristics, they'll be key indicators of such changes. For males, or alpha death claws, similar changes may occur albeit with testosterone. Testosterone also improves bone health, strength and recovery, and is also typically viewed as the chief male hormone, and one often associated with social dominance. Testosterone also causes different coloration in animals too, either brighter or darker colours depending on the taxa and the goal of the coloration or patterning, but overall it helps enhance visual indicators of the male's virility. So the dominant pair are effectively loaded up on assorted hormones that give them their large size and intimidating appearance that comes with their role as top dogs in the pack. Males are typically the wider dispersing sex over females, and this could explain the presence of savage death claws. They have the pronounced horns of matured dominant individuals, but are typically solitary, and it could be that these are breeding age adults that have either yet to find a receptive female or been displaced from their own pack by a superior male. Again, it's a surprise to see such advanced social endocrinology in animals descended from solitary lizards. But again, it could sprout from the very early attempts to create a super soldier. Any hormone that encourages bone growth and recovery will be useful in the field of combat, and creating sociality in a species will likely increase their skill and efficiency as a fighting unit. It's worth noting there are incidents of death claws breeding without the presence of alpha individuals. The doylist response to this is that in Fallout 3, there simply weren't any other variations of them. But Watsonian answers could be that it's something that only occurs with sufficient nutrients to facilitate the physical growth, and that the incredibly barren capital wasteland lacked the prey density for the change to occur, or just that in Old Olney and the Sanctuary the parents were out foraging. In the Devil's Dew quest, we see like many lizard eggs, Deathclaw mothers also don't incubate them, and instead partially bury them in either sand or rotting vegetation to keep them warm until hatching. Again, unlike their ancestors, death claws are born partially altricial, which is to say dependent on the parents. From the Mojave wasteland it seems like they're kept in a nursery area, with their parents until they're old enough to forage on their own, at which point the pack may become more mobile. Even with the death of her mate, a matriarch won't vacate the nest area until her young are ready. And Chomps Lewis does seem to suggest that if the main family unit are killed, the rest of the pack leave the area. So such small area occupation is likely a seasonal thing for breeding. The Deathclaw nest in Fallout 4 also seems to suggest, like birds of prey, whole carcasses are brought back for the offspring and dismembered on site for them. The horns of a Deathclaw are also pretty interesting, presumably a bizarre artifact of the FEV. The horns of the standard Deathclaw were made thicker in Fallout 4 to give the impression that they could ram things, and so it does seem like there's combat potential. 
The horns of alpha deathclaws are quite different to those of modern ungulates, either pointing straight forward or sweeping forward and above the eyes rather than to the sides. If the alpha were to lower its head, the curved tips would be in prime position to gore. Relatively simple horns are typically designed to do just that. Goat and antelope species that have such horns typically use them to attack the bodies of their rivals, sometimes with lethal intent. But at the same time, alpha horns have a long reach with a good catching arch that suggests that they can be used for wrestling too. But on top of that, they also have a very pronounced stabbing point. It's suggested more dual-use horns can be used primarily for wrestling, and then to stab if and when an opponent is knocked over. So for mature male deathclaws, it seems the horns are specialised as lethal weapons to be used against their own kind, and are just another tool to add to their extensive arsenal to help them in clawing out a pack of their own in the wastes. The horns of the matriarch can similarly vary, but seem to be much less geared for lethal combat. In the Mojave individuals, they sweep back over the head, and in Washington specimens, they almost resemble those of Cape Buffalo. Cape Buffalo are considered both rammers and wrestlers, animals that interlock weapons then vigorously push and twist to dominate with strength. This is less imminently lethal, and is also what we'd expect from the role of the mother in the social unit. Even if challenged by her underlings for dominance, she ideally doesn't want to kill her own progeny, so her weaponry is more about dominance via strength over out-and-out -out killing the competition. Such contests are also presumably rare, as with the large size and strength disparity too, matriarchs aren't likely challenged by other females in the social units too often. When roaming over the territory, they may still come in handy should they meet another matriarch, and they also have lethal weaponry in their teeth and claws should push come to shove. Even if they're no longer purely insectivorous, Deathclaw's diet is still comprised of protein first and foremost, and preferably in fresh chunks straight off the prey. The Fallout 3 art book at least suggests that their favourite prey may be the Brahmin cattle, and is reasonably large prey that can often have their instincts dulled by partial domestication, wherever possible Deathclaws likely do select for them, whether they're feral herds or part of a traveller's caravan. Together with humans and their assorted alternate forms like ghouls and super mutants, they likely form the most common large prey items in the wastes. And with even super mutants fearing death claws, it does seem anything and everything is on the menu. In the wasteland and many areas, this is often a route to success. Having no strict prey preference works for other animals too, and is one of the reasons why the spotted hyena is perhaps Africa's most widespread and numerous large carnivore. Unlike its larger or smaller rivals, it simply takes whatever is most common in the area, with no qualms over prey size or swiftness of consumption. Across the breadth of Africa and its numerous herbivore guilds, this ensures they'll always have something to eat. And so too with death claws over the American wastes. There's a number of localised prey species that can likely form an important chunk of diet in certain areas. In the Mojave, bighorns likely serve as important prey, and radstags around Washington. Myalurks and their associated royalty may be an important prey around wetland areas or rivers. In this regard, deathclaws may not stray so far from their origins, and still regularly consume invertebrates. With a large cast of mutated insects like bloatflies, radroaches, rad scorpions, and in some areas the godforsaken cazadors, deathclaws may frequently indulge in bug eating just as their initial stock did a few hundred years ago. Smaller prey like the roaches and bloat flies, along with mole rats, may also be important prey for young deathclaws as they practice hunting. As well as their physical power, this supreme adaptability is just one of the key factors that has led to their success. A final bizarre habit tying them to their origin species of chameleons is that some deathclaws still seem to have varying chromatophores in their skin. Deathclaws can have varying amounts of pigment, and albino or leucistic variations can be seen occasionally with a complete lack of pigment. But some appear to have randomly fluctuating colours. Chameleons' variable colours aren't to do with camouflage, but communication and thermoregulation, threatening away either predators or competitors, and changing with the temperature to help them maintain homeostasis. If deathclaws just view humans as food, then this is an odd feature to have, 
and may be a bizarre mutation to fit with the rest of the bizarre post-war mutations. An alternate explanation is that from attacks and harassment, Deathclaws do still view people as threats, albeit edible ones. And this flushing of colours is them displaying aggression as they attack too. Overall, the Deathclaw has a suite of grown and learned behaviours and abilities that place it at home as the top predator of the wastes, and one of the most famed enemies of the Fallout series. To talk a little on the design and general thoughts on Deathclaws, both the Fallout 3 and 4 editions were created by Jonah Loeb, who made the most recent version of them bulkier and more solidly built, with larger, more robust horns, and I think even with the graphical updates aside, they're the best looking rendition so far. The new animations they also get are generally fantastic too. Most of the info from this video comes from those games and New Vegas too, as I never really played any of them before 3, which is probably still one of my favourite games. Although according to some, I'm apparently wrong to think that. Loeb describes them as dragons of the waste, and one thing I do like about Fallout is how it's almost like a retro sci-fi pastiche of a lot of typically fantasy elements. There are super mutants stand in for ogres, the ghouls for the undead, giant insects are pretty universal between both genres, and some robots like the Sentrybot are reminiscent of enchanted suits of armour. Then the Deathclaws fill the role of the Dragon, or perhaps the Tarask, as this is what they're apparently based off when they were initially intended as a bear wolverine mutant hybrid. I am glad we got the eventual Deathclaw from that. And then with the Yao Guai, we were effectively able to have both anyway. They're a very signature part of the franchise, and it's pretty surprising to read they weren't initially considered for Fallout 4. But luckily they returned, and may they continue to do so in Fallout 5 and many more games in the series. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to my top patrons Big Al and Venomenon for their kindness in keeping the channel going, as well as Kay Sandom, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Sassy Birdo, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Names, Aesir, Karazul, Dodecablos, and Bazugazu Bachohatsu Bachomatsu for their continuing support. And thanks too to Carmen Rider Moten for providing the close ups of the Deathclaw heads, as well as the piece of one feeding on the Myluck Queen. For more of their digital artwork featuring assorted monsters, you can follow them at the links provided in the description. Thanks to you too if you made it this far. And if you're interested in more content like this, then many creatures of the Monster Hunter roster have already been covered, as well as other fictional lands like Skull Island. If you like what you see, please do consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others who may also enjoy my videos. Comments on what you thought are also always appreciated. Next time will be more Monster Hunter content, so hopefully everyone is curious about that, and I'll see you there for it.